Okay, thank you all for your patience. All right, so we're gonna start up again. And um, although I need no introduction, I actually failed to introduce myself earlier. So I will do so now, so I'm not a stranger talking to you. I'm Ellen Honigstock, I'm the Director of Education for Urban Green, and I'm responsible generally for the content of our programs and our education. All right, so we'll let folks come in. All right, I know the snacks across the hall are not that good. <laughs> this, is, this is a family holdback situation. Like, we totally know this. It's granola bars and coffee, so what I'm getting at is that there's probably some good networking over there, and there will be, we have two whole hours of a super fun reception after this conference. So, we're gonna pick back up with this fantastic second, second session. So the second session, we have entitled Preventing a Hot Mess, okay? This one is about converting, is about electrifying heat and, uh, heating and cooling systems in multifamily buildings. The panel will be moderated by Loic Chapose, is a senior, he's a senior advisor from NYSERDA, and we are proud to bring you three fantastic speakers. We have Jared Rodriguez from Emergent Urban Concepts, Kelly Dougherty from First Service Energy and Cecil Scheib from NYU. Now, Jared, I have not actually seen you today. Are you uh, fantastic? Come on up. <laughs> that made me very happy. So we're going to start off with uh, with Jared, and then Kelly, then Cecil, and then the everyone will take their seats up here, and we'll have the discussion. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm pretty excited to sit with these two folks. Um, they are movers and shakers in this industry. So uh, I'm going to run through this like as quickly as I possibly can so that we can get to the others and so that we can get to the questions because I think that's where most of the cool conversation is going to shake out. Um, I'm Jared. Uh, I have a background in civil engineering, so I'm not a mechanical engineer, FYI. <laughs> Uh, I worked for 10 years in commercial real estate, mostly working on large buildings, um, affordable housing. Uh, was uh, fairly involved with the uh, working group that was put together with Urban Green Council in the development of Local on 97, so that's, that was exciting work. Um, I'm still sort of like living off those fumes. <laughs> we need more of that. Uh, and um, now I'm doing a bunch of work with uh, NYSERDA on the Empire Building Challenge, and we can maybe uh, during the question and answer uh, period, we could talk a little bit more about what that program is, but public-private partnership between the state of New York, NYSERDA, and um, very large building owners. So focus on existing buildings, large buildings, um, the Empire State Building, uh, Penn Plaza, uh, very large buildings are in this program. Um, because we're attempting to come up with case studies and insights around decarbonizing these complex, uh, difficult to decarbonize buildings. Um, but we're finding that the insights that are, you know, in, in these difficult to decarbonize buildings uh, are broadly applicable just in general to a large number of building typologies and subsets. So we started off by saying there's there's fictions around electrification and misinformation, right? There's misinformation everywhere. <laughs> there's, there's myths, and the industry is riddled with myths. And those myths are fabricated to stall and delay action, right? And it's our job to speed up action, right? That's what we need to do. We need people taking action sooner rather than later. Um, because every ton that we reduce now uh, is worth more than tons reduced in the future, just based on the issue that we're dealing with, right? Um, so, you know, one of the first blind spots or, or myths or misconceptions is uh, two simple, simple paybacks. I think somebody brought this up earlier. Uh, we need to be looking at the net present cost of, of action, right? And the marginal cost of taking action over the baseline. Right, business as usual case. Um, that might seem like pretty standard to most of this room, but out there in the in the real world, uh, it's not. You know, folks are fixated on the simple payback um, on energy savings alone, 
uh, that's, that's clearly not, you know, that's not going to make electrification pencil out. Um, one-to-one -one equipment swaps, uh, this idea that we could just swap out a steam boiler with heat pumps, air source heat pumps, in an existing building, just not, like generally not viable um, from a, an upfront cost perspective uh, and from a, an operating expense perspective. So, you know, how do we think about resource efficient decarbonization? I'll get into what that means. Um, my engineer says no. I mean, this is a common refrain, and you know, we routinely hear <laughs> engineers saying that this is impossible. There, there are good engineers out there. You should figure out who they are and flock toward them. <laughs> um, but they need to understand resource efficient decarbonization as well. Um, electrify everything, right, all at once. Do it in one fell swoop. In most existing buildings, especially large buildings, it, it is just not viable. So we need to be doing it incrementalistically. I know incrementalism is sometimes a dirty word, uh, but in this case, it's not. I mean, we have to be doing continuous improvement over time to hit these goals, or it's not gonna happen, and we need to start now, yesterday. Um, the idea that you could just wait for better technology to come along, you know, I'm just gonna wait for the best uh, cold climate air source heat pump ever created to come along before I take any steps. I mean, it's not, it's not right. You know, you can't, you can't do that. Um, you, you know, you need to start take, taking enabling steps, right? And what do enabling steps look like? It's everything from making the building as energy efficient as possible uh, to installing certain infrastructure that will enable you to plug in these future technologies when they do emerge. Um, and install infrastructure that is technology agnostic, right, so that you can plug in whatever becomes available. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, that this isn't a tenant priority? Sure, I mean, in some buildings it's not, right? But what we're seeing in Class A office, for example, is that there, there is an emerging demand for clean office space, right? High performance office space. Um, as Fortune 500 companies start to mandate you know, ESG requirements and their shareholders are requiring it, shareholders are waking up to realize like, oh, these buildings or these, these companies occupy physical buildings. Well, what's, what's that building doing, right? Um, for a while, ESG wasn't even really like thinking about the physical world, and I think that world is waking up to, to this issue. Um, and then that electricity produces emissions. Well, I mean, New York State has a law, and it says that we will achieve zero emissions on the grid by 2040. Should we hold building owners accountable for the state's failure to achieve that goal? I mean, I don't know, that's a debate that we should have. <laughs> But at least in the Empire Building Challenge, right, we, we are taking the, um, the position that there is a declining curve for emissions coefficients to zero in 2040. Right? How else do you do capital planning? How, how do you plan for electrification uh, if you can't commit to a declining co a coefficient curve? Um, and then that this is do too disruptive, right? There's a decision-making tree, right? I mean, this is for any, any building, right? Operating a building is disruptive. <laughs> Having an, uh, a building that is occupied is disruptive. A building will always change, right? There is a baseline state of change. And so understand what the trigger points are for making a decision on which, you know, which pathway you're gonna take uh, and then build that into your decision-making tree. It's, it's pretty simple, right? It seems straightforward, but we know that there are a lot of building owners that aren't doing this. They're, they're not doing capital planning, they don't have a long-term outlook, and they're certainly not incorporating emissions into their long-term outlook. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but you know, what is strategic decarbonization assessment? Um, effectively capital planning. Uh, have, you know, have a cash flow model for the building, Go out as far as you possibly can. Maybe go out to you know your your goal year for decarbonization. Set a goal. Have a goal. If you don't have a goal, you don't know what you're working toward. Is it 2030? Is it 2035? Um, in the Empire Building Challenge, we have you know very large building owners setting goals for very large buildings. 
2035 or 2030, some at 2025. Um, so that term is, is critically important. And you know, feed in the baseline starting point. So assess the building from every possible angle and try to assess how the building might change, right? Like what are major repositionings that are coming up in the future and mark those inside your cash flow if you can. Um, and have as many different investment scenarios as possible. So, you know, when do you plan on putting in that, you know, Carrara marble lobby? <laughs> uh, are you prioritizing that over decarbonization? Have that conversation, talk to your asset managers. What's more important, claiming that you are a carbon neutral building or that you have a Carrara marble lobby, right? Make a decision um, and then, you know, uh, put a stake in the sand and say, okay, we're making this decision and we'll prioritize that later. Um, value non-energy benefits, I mean, this is obvious, it goes into developing a more complex uh, financial case or business case for making the investment. Um, and then just know, right, near-term years require more accuracy and detail, and then out years are more directional, right? You can guess. I mean, two years ago, no one would have guessed that we'd see 8% inflation or higher. Um, I don't think anyone would have guessed that the price of natural gas was going to double. So as long as we're generally making a trajectory and we're sticking to it in our planning, we're telling ourselves a story about how the building will decarbonize. And if people believe that story within the organization, they can get behind making investments. We tell ourselves stories all the time, right? About you know, the way our life is going to go, about the decisions that we're making, and then we justify those decisions. It's the same thing with buildings. And phasing is just absolutely critical. Um, so what is the uh, resource efficient decarbonization, or RED? We were calling it REE for, for a really long time. <laughs> uh, and then we realized that electrification was something like a dirty word. And so why don't we just change our language to get more people on board? It's fine. I mean, we could call it anything that you want <laughs> as long as you get on board. So resource efficient decarbonization is effectively uh, an incremental methodology or heuristic, like a thinking framework for approaching decarbonization at the building scale and typically with large existing buildings. Um, but I'm sort of convinced that if you follow this heuristic, you can do it almost like for anything. It could be a transportation system, right? It could be the DEP with all of those pumps that they run all the time. Um, but typically we're focused on large complex buildings. So what do you do first, right? You do a heat capacity review. You look at the building, you figure out uh, everywhere heat is coming in and everywhere heat is leaving. Um, and then identify for that fossil origin input, right? when, where, why, or how you're using fossil fuel. Like at what equipment are you using it? Um, why are you using it? And exactly when and under what outdoor air, con air temperature or weather conditions are you using it? And then you can go about the business of targeted reductions um, to make the building just generally more efficient. So start reducing, right? And we've been doing this for forever. I mean, since the 19th century, since we started heating buildings with central heating plants, right? Um, just because we're electrifying doesn't mean that we should be throwing energy efficiency or performance out the window. I mean, that theme keeps coming up, right? Efficiency is, is the most important thing, and electrification comes in tandem with that. So then draw a box around the building, right? And try to figure out all the ways that heat is being lost. I mean, heat, it really is like the elephant in the room here. If we expect electricity to decarbonize, right, how do we eliminate on-site fossil fuel for the production of heat or cooling, right? So draw that box around the building and find all the ways that heat is leaving the building and try to capture it and put it back in. Um, and then go about the business of right-sizing heat pumps to deal with particular loads and particular uses and think about ways to um, have multiple heat pump technologies and storage solutions, thermal storage solutions, work in tandem with one another to operate in a highly efficient tiered approach to reach that peak load. And then, you know, at the end of, the, of your journey, right, 
you can cut the cord or cut the pipe uh, to the gas network, and hopefully something has come along, you know, maybe a thermal utility that you can connect to to deal with that peak capacity issue. Um, you know, one of the other insights, and this isn't totally obvious, but in a hybrid scenario uh, where, you know, you do have fossil fuel on site, but you're augmenting with, with heat pumps, you know, you can if sort of efficiently and economically get to 80% heat pump coverage, even with heat pumps that don't operate, you know, very efficiently at low outdoor air temperatures. But does it really matter when low outdoor air temperatures occur? Very rarely, right? Um, that's something to consider. Uh, and then this is sort of a crazy picture. <laughs> but this is, this, these are all the ways, like in graphical form, for you to go about the business of trying to capture lost heat and keep it in the building, right? You could do it on the air side with heat recovery ventilation. Um, you could do it through active cooling. You could actively cool exhaust air to get that heat back into the building. You could freeze... Um, you could use uh, you know, exhaust heat to um, melt ice in the morning and then extract heat off of that ice when you need to ramp up for the day in an office building. Um, there's a whole number of ways to capture and move heat around a building. And I think that those are just cri those are critical aspects of building decarbonization is figuring out like what is the most appropriate way to capture, move, produce heat. And in general, like, we don't necessarily have to be producing heat. We're really just extracting it from an ideal location, potentially storing it, and then moving it to where we need to move it. Um, and so what is the process, right? It's developing a holistic decarbonization strategy. Exa assess your existing conditions, uh, establish your goal and your timeline. Um, build your team, make it as diverse as possible within the organization and for all the consultants that you hire, right? Um, align on objectives, make sure everyone's working toward the same goal and they, they're they speaking the same language. Oftentimes you have folks saying the exact same thing and they don't realize it and it turns into an argument. And then someone has to come in and say, actually guys, you were saying the exact same thing. Um, adopt this approach, resource efficient electrification, decarbonization, you decide what to call it high performance electrification. Uh, and then hold, you know, design charrettes with the entire team. You know, throw ideas against the wall. Um, figure out if, if they work or not. Uh, and then iterate on that until you've come up with a solution that's within that decision making tree. Um, conduct the analysis, the strategic decarbonization assessment, uh, so that you can decide, right, which, um, you know, which project to tackle first and phasing uh, so that you can prioritize projects and then refine and iterate. And that's it. I'll hand it over to, to Kelly. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I, just like everyone else, I'm so excited to be here in person for the first time in so long. Um, when I was on this stage three years ago, um, at this point, um, had no idea what was coming um, for us um, with um, the pandemic, so I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm quickly gonna give, by way of introduction, just an explanation of um, what first service first service residential is for those that you don't don't know, first service residential is the largest third party property management company in North America, and we focus only on residential. We have 8,300 properties that we operate. 3,300 of those are high rise and mid rise buildings. In 2009, first service saw a need to have a energy subsidiary underneath the umbrella of first service residential to help our buildings think about energy reduction and carbon. And this was a new thing for um, property management companies at that time. No one else was kind of focusing on this on the residential sector. As we heard in the presentations today, there are a lot of regulations some in the form, um, in some type of form, 
And probably most of us have seen this map before that shows the cities and the states that require energy benchmarking today. However, by 2024, with President Biden's National Building Performance Coalition energy and building performance regulations like that of Local on 97 uh, will be soon be the norm throughout the country. Over the next four years, buildings across the United States will be watching what we are doing here in New York City, in DC, in St. Louis, and in Boston. To name a few, the policies will be built off of our success. Therefore, it's important that we address and displace the myths that Jared went over, and also find solutions to the real problems that our buildings are having with moving forward with electrification in our existing buildings. In New York City, privately owned residential condos and co-ops are about 900,000 units. And unfortunately, although a little bit less complex than commercial buildings, privately owned condo and co-ops have some unique challenges that can be as barriers to implementation for electrification. Unlike a, traditional, um, unlike a traditional residential rental building or commercial office building, privately owned residential condo and co-ops are run by a group of volunteers elected by the owners of that building. In addition, these board members often have regular jobs of their own to balance their responsibilities as a board member. These board members, can also change year to year, which complicates the issue further. Board members rely on professional opinions, but in the end, it is their decision to proceed in any one direction. Living and owning in New York City can be challenging. There are many laws that boards must comply with simultaneously addressing the staff needs in the building, the, the current needs of the building, and future finances. Often boards have to choose what is most important to focus on, since this is they have limited time and resources. Board members also have a fiduciary responsibility to their owners or shareholders, which means that every decision that they make must be seen through that lens. Experimenting or taking chances on new technologies can often be extremely difficult for these boards. Although this does not apply to every building, I'm also shocked that buildings don't have healthy reserve funds. And reserve planning also, also typically is focused on a four-like replacement rather than other types of technologies. Financing in condo and co-ops is also complicated. Although lenders are better today than 10 years ago, Lending can be difficult if you don't have collateral or you're a co-op that recently refinanced and was not thinking about having more money. Non-traditional financing like PACE and uh, energy services agreements are options, but not all buildings can apply for those um, options. Condos and co-ops are also governed by their bylaws. And depending on the building, these documents may control a board's decision-making abilities. It can require that any money that is taken out require a uh, unit owner vote, which is very difficult to do. Also, any changes to bylaws, that, such as where common charge allocations are happening, may also require a unit owner vote to change for bylaws. So why that is important is if we are changing to a decentralized heating and cooling system for domestic hot water and your common charges were included in your common charges to make that change is also going to be difficult. Finally, boards like to feel that they can look to another similar building. and We don't have them here in existing buildings. There are some that are happening now, but we're not there yet. I often have conversations with boards and, they, and their simple request is, show me an existing condo or co-op building that has done it, and I cannot. As part of the planning process for Local Law 97, many of our buildings have begun the process of evaluating the path forward to electrification. 
since costs associated with electrification are a large part of the decision making across buildings, I'm going to show a few examples of what this financial outlook looks like. This is not, these are not going to be the example for every building, but I want to show you the challenges that are being faced by condos and co-ops. The first building is a pre-war high rise in Brooklyn. This building has had many issues with converting, some of which include finding space for outdoor equipment. However, the costs associated with electrifying were far too great for the building to consider at this time. With that being said, this is a progressive board. So what they are doing today is they are upgrading their electrical infrastructure with hopes to be ready to convert to electric heating and cooling in the future while, while converting their in-unit appliances to electric. The next building, however, is a little bit more promising. Here you can see the cost differences between upgrading their base fossil fuel system and our le electrifying to package terminal heat pumps is just around $400,000 difference. This building is still uncertain about the technology, however, and has chosen not to move forward. They will, however, be converting one apartment, which will hopefully provide the confidence to the rest of the building that this technology works. This is a real situation and unfortunately one that I'm constantly dealing with. The last building is a modern Manhattan high rise. These options also look drastically uh, more expensive than upgrading their two pipe steam system with a gas boiler that will probably get them another 10 to 15 years with local law 97. However, when you change the equation a little bit and show them a 15 year capital expenditure um, comparison through all of the different packages, including operating costs, upfront costs, and fines over a 15 year period, all of a sudden, deep retrofit package one does look better. Once again, this building does not trust the technology of heat pumps. So they are also doing a sample apartment to watch it for a year. This kind of terrifies me because one apartment watching for 12 months means that we are going to be delayed also with local law 97. We need to find a solution faster. Electrifying requires buildings to be forward thinking and unfortunately it's challenging in multifamily buildings. Typically making decisions that will affect a building beyond five years is difficult. So from my perspective, there are a few things that we need to do to prepare our buildings and remove the barriers or bottlenecks to get the city electrified. Planning ahead, I spoke about this a little bit before. Reserve studies need to start thinking about carbon, not just about replacements of what is in the building today. Capital needs assessments, carbon and energy audits also need to be included in one package for a building. Currently, when buildings are, when condo co-ops are doing reserve studies, they're not aligning them with capital needs as well, which is a problem, and Local Law 97. We also need to help our buildings think about doing electrification or decarbonization in a phased approach. There are ways to do this. We need more demonstration projects. We need them in condo and co-op world. It's not enough that a owner or developer of a large skyscraper is doing these projects. We need to be able to point to condo and co-ops. We also need incentives. We probably are well aware, most of us in this room, that the heat pump incentive earlier this year ran out of funding. That was a big problem for a lot of buildings that are relying on that money. Those projects that I showed you earlier went from $4 million to $2 million for an upgrade. Without that $2 million for these incentives, these early adopters are not going to proceed. Lastly, we need stakeholder engagement. We need to continue stakeholder engagement. The building grades on the front of our buildings have helped but they're not the only thing that needs to happen. 
We need to educate our staff in our buildings. We need to think about how we can incentivize them to reduce carbon as well while operating a building. And we also need to think about how we educate the greater public on what carbon is. Buildings, um, my team and I sit in board meetings in cities around the US and Canada. And although I hear this, this statement all the time that New Yorkers are different or New York is different, in this context, we are not. Boards may have different priorities or regulations depending on where they're located, but issues I see, receive in the boardroom in these meetings are exactly the same struggles. Therefore, it's important that we don't forget that this important subset of the building sector and not only debunk once again all of the myths that uh, Jared has gone through and some I'm sure that we'll also discuss during the panel, but pave the way for more electrification projects by removing all of these barriers. Thank you. Hi folks, how's it going? Everyone doing good? I'm back. Oh, that's me. I'm Cecil Scheib, I'm from NYU. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about NYU and our approach to going fully electric um, in buildings. Um, so first off, um, if you haven't been to NYU, it's a lovely place, I suggest you visit sometime. Just, you know, come on over. Um, we're one of the city's uh, largest employers. We're one of the largest private universities in the country. Um, and we are, are about 0.3% of all New York City building emissions. So when we reduced um, our uh, building energy intensity and um, emissions intensity as part of the first uh, New York City Carbon Challenge period, um, that was about 0.1% of all New York City building emissions. So you can, you can see how this government leadership and the public-private partnerships really can make a difference very quickly. Um, our forward goals are a net 50% reduction uh, from our 2006 baseline uh, by 2025 and to be carbon neutral by 2040. Um, and in addition, we have one scope three goal, which is uh, called the Cool Food Pledge, which uh, um, in which we commit to reduce uh, the emissions from our food purchasing 25% by 2030. You know, when we go through and do this, of course, climate, that's the existential crisis, but in terms of the experience of the occupants of our campus, the students, the faculty, the people that work here, the most important thing is that better buildings are healthier buildings for, for, for people, right? For, for the occupants of the building, it's the co-benefits that matter most. And what I always remind people is every time you are distracted from your work by a draft, a leak, being overheated, being overcooled in summer, right? Stuffy air, all those are energy waste, right? So making our buildings better, reducing costs, and making people healthier, because as we know, Better airflow can double people's cognitive function. You know, a study shows that's our mission, right, is academic excellence. So you really have to bring all those things together. So this is where we were 10 years ago. This is a um, student residence on Broadway at um, East 10th Street. It was built about 100 years ago as a hotel. Um, this is somewhat like a... Um, multi-family building and that it's got lots of people living in it um, in bedrooms, a little different in that it does not have kitchens um, in this building. Um, it had um, single pane windows that didn't seal. It had number four oil boiler in the basement. So of course you have a, you have a um, surface flooding risk. If this was in a flood zone, you'd have a, you'd have a coastal, coastal flooding um, risk. And as part of the renovation, we were able to get rid of the uh, oil boilers in the basement. Um, when we put in you know, better windows, insulation, you could move to a natural gas um, uh, system on the roof, you know, condensing boilers, lightweight. This fits into that um, electric ready uh, you know, sort of category that was talked about. You know. And actually, you know, when you're speaking, Diana, it, it made me wonder, would this building meet, you know, like the electric ready 
part of the code. It'd be interesting to go back and look at what we did um, if, it, if, if it did. And this building did not have AC. But by doing all this, you know, being electric ready, and we were able to cut costs and uh, carbon emissions by just about half, including adding AC. But I think the other really interesting story about this building, I think is very applicable to many people in New York, is when we poll our students and say, what don't you like about being you know, at NYU? Like, what are the challenges? One real common thing is to talk about noise. It's so loud here in New York, and our students live on Fifth Avenue, Third Avenue, 14th Street, downtown Brooklyn, you know, some of the loud, loudest parts of the city. Well, when we took these old single pane windows and went to even a double pane window, this building, when we poll students, went from like 18th out of maybe 21 dorms in terms of like uh, rankings on sound, sound performance to second. Right, and so you see that difference. And so I challenge um, our teams to think not just about the marginal cost of going to, let's say, you know, like a triple pane window in terms of the energy savings, but look at that cost in terms of the value to NYU of a student who does better on their midterms because they could sleep through the night even though an ambulance pulled up under their window at 3 a.m. right, with the sirens wailing. So that brings us to where we are now. This is a very similar building Reuben Hall, also built about uh, 100 years ago as a hotel um, at the uh, corner of um, Fifth Avenue and uh, 10th and 11th Streets. And I'm gonna be speaking about it, but of course I wanna give credit to the project team, everyone in the Office of Construction Man uh, Management and uh, facilities at NYU and um, FX Collaborative, AKF and SWA. Uh, Stephen Winter Associates, who, who, who did the design for this project. So this is an all-electric design from the ground up, and it's very interesting um, to you know, see what you know, Jared laid out as the process and see what we did without maybe that superstructure, that mental superstructure, just where we got to, just thinking it through, and some things we did different. Right? This is not an incremental or a marginal plan. This is you got the building empty, you're going to renovate it, you know, do it all at once. So all electric, we did go to the triple glazing windows. And one thing we did in this project that we didn't do at Brittany was to go to that outdoor air supply, which is so important both for health to give people filtered air and to get those sound quality and sound control benefits, right? It doesn't help to put in a triple pane window if then students have to crack the window to get fresh air because all the sound will just come in, plus you'll be overheating and um, overcooling. We do hope that with the envelope improvements, the insulation, uh, the air sealing, the windows, and the overall energy use, that we will be eligible for um, Passive House uh, certification under the Enerfit uh, track, like the retrofit track. And as of this moment, we're to be certified. I don't know what we'll where it will be when we actually get a certification, but were it to happen now, it would be the largest residential passive house retrofit uh, project in the world. So we're very excited about that. Significant support from both the state and from the, and from the uh, uh, utility. And as the state meets its uh, decarbonization goals for the grid, we'll see this become a truly carbon you know, a, 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 a zero carbon building, no offsets required, right? 100% electric and a, and a green grid. So how do we make the case to, to go there? And I'll, you know, be honest that some of our drivers are different than other buildings in the, uh, you know, in the multifamily sector, but I think there are some things that are common. So on the right side here, scenario C, that's sort of like the business as usual, right? You go for lowest first cost, that's the bottom of the bar, um, you know, the base of the bar, you know, your energy use, what it is, and then you expose yourself to future costs. That could be local on 97 fines for NYU, which has a carbon neutral goal. That could mean buying offsets um, if we didn't otherwise electrify, right? There are those future costs. And we did look at uh, an option A on the left side of the bar that said, what if we just go all electric, right? What if we just focus on meeting our carbon goal by going all electric and don't bring that fresh air to rooms, because remember, this is a 100-year-old building, and to bring fresh air to rooms mean we had to duct throughout the building. We had some existing shafts that could be used, but adding fresh air supply to every residential space, this 18-story building. Um, and we decided to do it, and you can see it. It, it raises the first cost you know, substantially. 
And when people say, well, the cost to electrify, it's like, yeah, there was, there's marginal cost on buying heat pumps over buying you know, a natural gas boiler, sure. But it really was that uh, fresh air supply that was um, you know, so important to us. But when you take that all into account and you look at a 30-year total cost of ownership, and I 100% um, support the idea like simple paybacks have got to be out. You've got to look at that total cost. And I love the 30-year total cost of ownership idea, and it's so persuasive. And, and in fact, you can say, I'm not saying this works in every situation or for every board. I'm, not, I'm just saying, here, here's an idea. You can say, hey, we've got this idea. We're going to go to zero carbon, and the energy savings will pay for 85% of the marginal cost of that project, and we'll be carbon neutral. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? The energy savings are almost going to cover the cost of doing it. I'm sorry, 85% means there was infinite payback. It never paid back based on energy cost. But when you say that way, hey, we're doing the right thing. We're acting to have our planet safe for everyone, and the energy costs are going to pay back most of the cost. Maybe that's a, a you know a powerful argument for some. It also helped that um, um, without bringing in the fresh air, we wouldn't be able to lead certify, which is our standard, you know, in pursuit of of health and other benefits and we get the reputational benefit of hopefully being able to certify Passive House. But of course, at the end of the day, it's not about the piece of paper. You can wave around and say, we have these certifications. About, it's about the actual benefits for the people that live in the building. And when that ambulance pulls up and they've got their you know, triple pane window closed and it's still quiet and they can study, that'll be the payoff. And as Ritz said earlier, you know, we're, you know, we're fighting a two-front war both on mitigation and also the adaptation, having a building that's so much more resilient because things are out of the flood zone, because the building will hold heating and cooling in the event of a power outage. Um, this is what's really important. So this is gonna drive us towards our uh, carbon goals, meet the local on 97 goals, and also have the best environment um, for the students who live in the building. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to bring up our moderator and our panel. Thank you all for uh, those uh, presentations and for those very, very uh, candid presentation, both about the successes that you've had, but also the very, very, very real challenges of uh, electrifying uh, multifamily buildings of any shape and form. So I have a, a couple of questions prepared. Uh, by design, not too many, which, is, which means that I'm turning to uh, all of you in the audience to put in your question, to up them. We'll hopefully get to the, the questions from, from you guys. Uh, very, uh, very, very quickly. So maybe just a, a, a warm-up question. You guys touched on it, but I, I think it's really, really the, the one of the key, the key elements how we get there. We all, you all laid out some of the challenges and, and some of the processes and answer of how, how can an owner execute, plan and execute what is a very uh, complex, a very tricky, something that is, is, is quite frankly difficult and that many people still see as impossible, which is the, this decarbonization, this electrification retrofit. For the different type of buildings that you guys, all three of you work on very different type of building, what would be kind of the first step that a, a co-op kind of board, that a large building, that a large organization like NYU should take in, in, in you know, overcoming this very real mental barrier of like, this probably cannot be done when, when we know it can. I think I touched on this a little bit, but I'll say it again. Um, I think it's all about planning. So we, a good amount of our buildings right now are doing um, decarbonization studies um, with you know, jb and is doing one, uh, Stephen Winter Associates is doing a lot of them for us. Um, um, and many other engineering companies out there, and I don't remember who said it, but make sure you have the right engineer uh, doing these studies and is really thinking more long term. Um, it, it does frustrate me a little bit when um, a, I see a report from an engineer that is just a list of ECMs that was in an 87 report and saying that, hey, that's what you got to do for decarbonization. Um, that's not correct. Um, we need to be thinking more long-term and we need to help our buildings think more long-term by planning. 
So Cecil kind of mentioned narrative, right? I, di I did as well. I think that is such a critical piece of this whole thing because if a board is telling itself a story or an owner is telling itself a story that electrification has to happen all at once, they're not, they're not moving, right? If they can start to think about a building as a mashup <laughs> of lots of different systems that can be tackled separately or partially over time, right? Time is the other element. Then they'll move. They can move incrementally. And we have to get them moving now and continuously, right? Until they achieve their goal. It's like, how do you eat an elephant, right? Bite by bite. Um, this is one of the biggest, I think, mental barriers out there stopping folks from taking any type of step. Um, yeah, I, and, and just the time element um, is just lost on folks, like thinking that, again, it's, that this has to all be done at once, that the building is sort of static and it's not deteriorating or like it won't need investment continuously over time. Um, this, is some, this is another myth that I think kind of forces people to get delayed. Um, you know, your, your envelope, the building envelope, is constantly deteriorating. And we have certain laws in place that require uh, owners of masonry buildings to make massive investments. Uh, is there a way to stabilize that building envelope while also you know, improving the, the performance value of it uh, to reduce those recurring, those recurring costs? You know, for a co-op board, I've seen like a 20 year cost for maintaining a building envelope equivalent to something like $35 million, right? Um, when the, the cost of overcladding the, build, the same building might be 25 million. So the, the total cost of like doing nothing is sometimes far greater than the cost of making some type of intervention. I don't know if you wanna add anything. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like the, like the story is so important, you know, New York construction costs are so big, and so I, I found it's really helpful at NYU, number one, you have to focus on the marginal cost of, of doing better. You have to say, okay, well, we're at the point in the capital cycle where this building needs some sort of reinvestment. There's a base cost, that's whatever our standard is, that's our policy. Now in terms of the cost-benefit calculation, I'm only gonna focus on the marginal cost and, and look at those benefits you get from the marginal um, cost and wait to get all the numbers in. During the design process, the numbers, both the energy savings, the carbon savings, the construction costs, they bounced all over the map. We did version after version after version of, of, our, of our costs and benefits until we were ready to actually you know, present to NYU uh, senior leadership to spend that money, that first cost, that's gonna pay back over time, but that first cost, but you have to get all your numbers together first. Thank you. So we, we talked about this, this mental barrier of the story, this mental barrier of the, of the first cost. Kelly, you, you touched also on, you know, we don't trust this new technology. Uh, there, there's other barriers that we hear about a lot from, uh, from owners, and I know when, when preparing together, one that, that came up was the, the shifting cost of the, the heating, uh, the hot water, but maybe we'll, we'll leave that to the next panel, but the cost of the heating you know, and cooling to, to the tenants, or between the, the owners and the tenants, is it, is it something, for example, Kelly, that you, you've experienced in your discussions with, with the, old, the, the vast portfolio of building, either in New York or outside of New York, and, and how, how does that discussion usually go, and is, is there any ways to overcome that mental barrier when discussing with, with owners or, or advocating on a co-op board? A very good question, um, and unfortunately, I have to break that myth um, quite often <laughs> um, because people typically think when we're talking about electric heating, we're talking about electric resistance heat. And someone on the board, we, I had a conversation uh, about a month ago with a board that got very heated with each other, um, not with me, um, with them. <laughs> um, and they were arguing over the fact about um, how much more they were gonna be spending on um, electric heating. And she, the, one of the board members was comparing that to her home that has electric resistance heat and how she can't afford to put the heat on and ends up having to put on a, a wood stove um, to be able to heat the house during the winter. Um, and it, 
it took over the conversation on the board. And all of a sudden, this con I, I couldn't even get it back to um, understanding the technology and what the difference is between electric resistance heat and heat pumps because to Jared's point, like once they have that in their mind, they, they kind of um, went for it. Um, I, I kind of mentioned this in the other, um, while I was presenting, but also common charges does come into play here. Um, once again, I'll just bring that up. Like how a building pays for their heating and um, when you decentralize your heating and your cooling, um, that does change some things about the building and it, it is a process to change. I, it can be done. Like there is a will. We, all of this can be done. Um, it just takes time and planning. Um, but just to give you like some idea, if you're going to change bylaws, you can pretty much expect that that's going to take eight to twelve months. So just rewind time from where we want to be and how long that's going to take, among other things. So before you can even hire the engineer to start doing the design, you need to get approval board approval, you need to make the bylaw change, you need to then go into design, then you need to um, get the contractors. Like, we're, we're way behind for a lot of buildings. Just would add a nuance to it as well, if you're going in the other direction and you're taking, say, decentralized cooling, you know, window ACs or sleeve ACs, and you're going to a central system, sort of in the way that the, the dorm did with a hydronic distribution system and fan coils, um, then you're taking a responsibility that was on, say, the individual co-op owner and putting it into the common charge, which is like another uh, very difficult hurdle, I think, to get over. Co-ops or condos um, have very unique uh, issues that they need to overcome, and I'd love to be a fly on the wall when you're sitting in one of these board meetings having these conversations about resistance heat versus um, you know, heat pump. Yeah, I mean, just the honestly, the language that we adopt uh, and use to talk to the general public is is so important, right? If we use language that um, makes it seem, for example, that the only type of heat pump is an air source heat pump, then the public is going to be confused and they're going to think that that's the only option, right? When there's a whole variety of heat pumps that are available that you could combine even. Right, there is no one solution. I mean, I'm a firm believer that you know every building is a is a unicorn, right? And then the conditions that surround that unicorn building are also a unicorn. So it's a unicorn squared for every single in individual building. And we're often talking about, well, like what's replicable? You know, what technology can I just implement in every single building, and it's the same every time? That's confusing people um, because they think that they can just plug something in when typically you know, they can't. And then they try and they do studies and they spend money and they're told that they can't because the cost is extreme. So I think we have to have a different way of talking about this. Um, and I'll leave it up to you know, most people in the room to help determine what that is. But you know, we're, we're grappling with this in Empire Building Challenges. Like how do we frame our language and our narrative to get people to move and think differently and to get even engineers to come up with better solutions Right, because once we once we get engineers sort of out of their like mind prison as well, they start to come up with really good solutions. Um, so I, I think that's yeah, that's that's sort of a critical issue. I don't know if you can add anything to it. Well, I think that that's a really good segue to maybe a first first question from the from the audience. The question is, it, it sounds like there's a strong need to rebrand electrification to avoid uh, conflation with electric resistant heat. What should we call it if not electrification? I think, Jared, you, you touched a little bit on it, but it sounds like the language is really important in every type of building and decision-making venue. Maybe that's a, a, a topic that we can work on a working group um, for <laughs> communications and think about how, how we can rebrand it. Um, I'm not a marketing specialist, so I, I don't know. So uh, I'll, I'll tell a story. I won't name names. <laughs> I was in a meeting with um, a, a, a union leader, and we went through this heuristic. Um, it, I can't say which union it is, but it's like critical to the story. Um, it's a union that really likes pipe. <laughs> and uh, they were very adamantly opposed to the word electrification, 
right? Because they think that it is uh, electrification is like air side only air source heat pump, and that sure it's going to like gr create a lot of work for, I don't know, sheet metal workers, right? Building duct work, right? But it, and and maybe electricians, but it's going to take all the pipe fitters jobs away. I'll just say it, it was the pipe fitters, <laughs> if you couldn't guess, and. We, you know, we said, well, what, you know, well, what if, we, you know, really, this is just decarbonization. Like, we're trying to reduce emissions. That's what matters is reducing the emissions. And they're like, well, why don't you just say that? Why don't you use the word decarbonization? And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, our our words our words matter, right? In the way that we explain this problem, really, it really does matter. And you know, subsequently, that union was pretty effective at getting this uh, thermal utility bill passed over the past couple weeks, um, which is gonna be a, a critical pathway to decarbonizing lots of existing and new buildings, I think. So, you know, we can, we can convert people to our side just on how we describe this problem and, and the language that we use. Um, it, re it really is like sometimes that, that easy. And so don't be married to any particular word Right, we can't. <laughs> we can't. We can't do that. We, you know, we don't have a choice. Um, and don't be married to any particular, like, pathway either or technology. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Cecil. Your your rubbing hole was a real hit, and people really want to know more. So there's a number of questions asking: Is it heat pumps? Did you guys had had insulation? So could could you tell us in a few words a little bit more about sure. about that project and what the plan is? Yeah, so just a, just a couple more details about that project, because again, other than not having kitchens, I think that building is fairly typical of, you know, somewhere, you know, uh, you know, probably hundreds of millions of square feet of uh, similar sort of brick-clad, steel frame, pre- or post-war construction in the city and 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 the local uh, area in the region. So um, we did add, um, we will add internal insulation up to the passive house standard. So in board, I mean, it's a historic building, so we weren't gonna overclad or look at that. Um, a lot of work with the windows, um, including specific uh, need for um, a hearing uh, with the Landmarks Preservation Commission um, to approve the windows and a lot of work directly uh, with the window manufacturers to find a window that would meet the passive house standard and all of NYU's requirements and, of course, the historic and the, you know, like the aesthetic requirements. Um, will be blower tor uh, door tests uh, towards passive house standard. Um, the DOAS system will use a, VR, um, um, a VRF system. Everything's um, for the heating of the buildings on the roof. So um, a VRF system on the roof, and then air source heat pumps to um, feed a water loop, and then fan coils uh, in the rooms. So it's basically you know like a two pipe system. Um, there are multiple shafts for the different um, uh, air source heat pumps. So in, theor in theory, during you know shoulder seasons, you could have the south of the building set at a different temperature than the north of the building. Maybe if the calls for heat or cooling were slightly different, but basically it's a two-pipe system. And then interestingly, the domestic hot water, which is also electric, so the rooftop air source units are oversized for the heating load of the building to also pick up the hot water needs of the building. But for space reasons, we actually located the water heater in the cellar. And so we have a water-to-water domestic water heating system. So it, so the so the rooftop air source pumps grab heat out of the air, they put it in the water loop, it goes down to the basement, it's lifted again by another set of heat pumps, lift meaning added energy, added water, and then it goes back to the rooms. Thank you, I hope that satisfies the, all the curiosity about what, what is really a, a truly great project. So we have about five minutes left. So. What, what I propose we do is take the, maybe the, the, the last two questions and, and what are the, the two most upvoted questions in, in, in the audience. So all of you touched uh, in, in more or less depth on the non-energy benefits, the other benefits of decarbonizing uh, and, and doing those, those retrofits. So the question is, are there any tools for quantifying some of the soft benefits of these retrofits, for example, health benefits, social benefits. 
any tools that you can recommend. I would, I would add maybe any tools that you know are under development, upcoming, any, any processes that you guys have, have used or, or see working in, in your projects. So I can, I mean, I can sort of start with that. So look, NYU spends $100 million a year on healthcare for its employees, and we are self-insured. Those are claims, those are not premiums. And we have like the CPT codes. Like we can tell what was like respiratory issues or things that might be related to indoor air quality. So it's a research project to see if we can actually tie like our healthier buildings to uh, reduced healthcare costs. And that's, you know, really exciting. When you saw what I showed there and you've got bar graphs, those are hard costs, right? Because I pitch internally, hey, guess what? We're gonna be healthier, it's healthy, 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 healthy. And my EVP says, so Cecil, you're saying if we put that money into the building, I can take that money out of the healthcare budget next year and HR will, oh, well, it's not gonna happen that quickly. Okay, well, so then that's not a hard saving. So that doesn't go into the bar graph. Instead, it goes into that grid that says just a check or an X, right? Those are the, those are the benefits that are hard, hard to uh, you know, quantify. And I think the work, part of the work is over time, moving more of the things into the intangible, sort of the qualitative benefit into that quantitative hard benefit. I think that will help move the needle, but honestly, people are pretty persuaded by health, happiness, and things like that. No one wants to get hot cold calls um, and have lots of complaints from your tenants, even if it's hard to put a specific number on it. I could just add like an insight, I guess. There's, you know, billions upon billions of dollars going into this question, but it's like in the world of social media and PR and marketing, right? And so just, we haven't tapped that industry to do this for us, and maybe we should. Um, behavioral science is, you know, it's a, it's a massive industry, uh, making a lot of people a lot of money for bad things. So maybe we can reorient them toward doing good <laughs> for society to convince people that this is something that has uh, intangible benefits or quantifying those intangible benefits. I mean, computer science can do it. Thank you. So maybe the last question, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to combine our, our, our top two questions and I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Kelly. So given the uh, democratic structure of a co-op or, or kind of board, if a co-op really, really wants to install Carrera Marble over doing decarbonization, is there any ways to overcome that resistance? Is there any tactics? I know one of your slide mentioned a champion, for example, but what, what are ways, you know, if I'm, for example, I'm sitting on a co-op board and I'm, I'm the lone person that really is pushing decarbonization over, over marble, what, what do I do? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, yeah, it, the marble is one thing, but uh, like the hallway renovations and, and things like that, it, that's in, in my world, that's how I'm, I look at it, um, is definitely gets to the hot, the top of the list all the time. Um, the lobby renovations and the hallway renovations rather than the other um, projects. Um, a suggestion um, is to first put together a committee, um, so a green committee or an energy committee in the building. Um, those individuals will be your scouts, be your champions, be the people that are going to do the research, work with the engineers, work with like First Service Energy or your management company, whoever it is, um, to help you kind of lay out a plan. Because boards don't have an infinite amount of time, if you have one team just focusing on that one issue and then bringing recommendations over to the board, it seems to help a lot. Um, and also usually those people are champions and passionate about in the environment, so they look at things from a different lens as well. Um, so I highly encourage that. Um, when I talked about before thinking about like your capital planning for a building, um, we need to restructure the conversation to um, 15 to 20 to 25 year plans. And if you want that marble um, you know, floor or that renovation, um, put it into the plan though, but think about, but, but do everything in phases so that you're not spending $2 million or whatever it might be to redo the hallways ahead of a decarbonization um, strategy. So again, it goes into you know, full planning for that building. So not, not so different from the planning that you were mentioning, right, in, in those much bigger, you know, those New York high rises, more complex buildings. So there's some similarities in the end. Great, well, I think we are at time. I really wanna thank you all of you for your presentation, for 
uh, agreeing to speak to those difficult questions, right? Those are, this is not the, the easy panel of the day. I don't think there was any easy panel of the day. And, and thank you everyone in the audience really for the, 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 the thoughtful question as well.